Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our second session with Chris Magwood uh, from the Endeavour Centre. He's based in Toronto, so I'm Steve from Abodo, and we've got Chris from the Endeavour Centre, and then we've got my colleague Joe Baxter, um, who's Hi, based. He's based in Melbourne, but he's actually up here in Sydney with me this week. For those of you who are struggling to get the um, CBD question handout, so this is for the Australian Registered Architects, and I do believe the New Zealand Institute of Architects has allowed for the CBD points. So for those of you uh, that are registered in New Zealand, you can get CPD for this as well. So for the CPD question sheet, it is just in the handout section. So you can pop along there to the handout section. Um, and then we'll review the answers at the end. But um, so once you have uh, sub, uh, filled out the CPD question sheet for those wanting a formal CPD point, just send the answers to me. Some people put it in the body of the email. Some people will attach it as a PDF. Um, and then I'll send a bit of paper to you within the next seven working days. Um, yeah, we'll start uh, in a few minutes. The numbers are kind of climbing. But what I will just quickly touch on is um, just a little bit about who Abodo is. So I'm sure many of you either work with us on a regular basis or have looked to specify or use our uh, product on a project somewhere. So really our hero product is what we call Vulcan. So it's this beautiful timber that you see here and using thermal modification, so very high heat, we're able to change the cellular structure uh, of the timber. What this does is it makes it more durable um, so like a durability class two, so you'd be getting at least 30 years minimum out of it and you will get no leaching, uh, which has been a huge concern. So unlike hardwoods, the Vulcan doesn't actually leach. Um, and then also um, it can be used for cladding, it can be used for screening, it can be used for battens. It can be used uh, for also light structural members as well. So it can be used for up to a GL8. And then obviously, most importantly, it's a plant. It's an FSC plantation timber. So we also have it. It comes with an environmental product declaration. And um, and for the New Zealand market, it is it, it has a, a declare certification. So for the Living Future Institute, so it's a red list free product as well. So that's really what we do is we do a sustainable timber, which I suppose you could say it ticks every single box from very, very low movement. It would be half the amount of maintenance with say a hardwood, an Australian hardwood, um, which has, has an oil on it. What I'm just going to do is I'm just going to share a very quick poll. So if you're wanting a bit more information or you're wanting to see a sample, that kind of thing, just click on the poll, send me a little bit more info, um, and we can send send some info to you. Now, if anyone's got any questions, please, as the question comes to your mind, please just uh, pop the question in the chat box. We'll flag it, and then we'll address all the questions at the end. So we've left sort of about 15 minutes or so just so we can answer any questions. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to hand over to Chris. And Chris, if you just start off just telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do, um, got to be awesome. Sure, great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks to uh, the whole team at Aboto for uh, inviting me to, to give this presentation. Uh, we did this, I guess, a week or two ago, and uh, it was great. There were some excellent questions, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to doing this again. Um, yeah, I um, I work for a sustainable building school in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada, um, where we um, design and build structures, and our students are sort of the, the workforce that uh, puts the buildings together. So they get a lot of hands-on experience with some you know interesting and innovative materials and mechanical systems and, uh, and things like that. And uh, I'm actually going to kind of tell you a bit of my personal story as as the as the way uh, into tonight's presentation about about carbon storing in buildings. 
so I, my, my sort of uh, career as a builder started um, in the mid 1990s when my partner and I decided to build ourselves uh, a house and we did a lot of research on how we could do this in the sort of the most ecologically uh, sustainable way. And we ended up building the first uh, code approved straw bale house in this part of Canada. And that was not an intentional career step, but it ended up being a career step because uh, lots of other people were interested in that at the time. And uh, that turned into a uh, 15, almost well, 10 year career as a, as a, uh, an owner of a design build firm, um, doing a lot of straw bale and kind of, uh, alternative material construction, along with a lot of renewable energy systems and things like that. And then for the last 15 years, I've kind of, uh, moved over to, to the teaching role where we're still designing, uh, and constructing buildings like that. Um, but in an educational setting. And so I kind of, um, I started in the building industry at a time when in the 90s, suddenly, you know, everything was green. There wasn't a single product that wasn't somehow uh, being being touted as being green. And, you know, it didn't take me very long, even as an owner builder, to realize that some of these things, some of these claims I was seeing were true, and some of them certainly were not. Um, but one of the things that, that I, it, it sort of impressed on me that was really important if I was going to be designing and building for other people is, you know, I really wanted to make sure that if we were claiming that what we were doing was somehow better for the environment or somebody's health or anything like that, um, that it was really important to us to try to prove it and, and have metrics so that we could, you know, um, really describe to people what we were achieving um, and, and show them what, what kind of uh, levels of, um, you know, greenness we were, we were achieving for them on their, um, on their projects. And that led to kind of developing uh, a whole uh, criteria matrix. So you can see on the screen, we look at ecosystem impacts and energy efficiency and indoor environment quality and waste and, you know, a whole bunch of, of other metrics. And in, I guess, about 2012, um, I have a daughter who was just turning 16 at the time and obviously like lots of young people quite concerned about what's going on with the climate and you know she knows what I do for a living but she she asked me a question that sort of uh, changed the, my direction again um, she said so dad like I know you do this green building thing but is it is it helping the climate like are you doing something good for the climate that I can you know feel like, you know, there's somebody trying to do something so that I have a, a decent climate. And I could say to her very honestly that yes, you know, the buildings that we were doing, you know, by that time we were doing really energy efficient buildings, we were putting them all on renewables. So I knew on the kind of operational side of the building um, that, that, you know, I could answer her honestly and say, yep, yeah, I think I'm doing something good, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell her that that on the material side of things that you know the the emissions that come from making the materials for our buildings I didn't really have any sense of whether I was doing the right thing the wrong thing or or you know how any of that worked and so um you know her question along with you know like there's these two young women on the on the screen here you know there's a lot of people in younger generations kind of asking uh, people like me, like, hey, what are you doing? And <laughs> can you do more and better and faster? And so um, that that sort of started me really looking at the carbon footprint of the materials that we were putting into our buildings. And it didn't take very long once I scratched the surface uh, of examining that to find out that, you know, this was a big piece and that I had been missing it for um, the whole first half of my career wasn't really thinking about the carbon footprint of the materials and uh, I ended up calling it the carbon elephant in the room because you know it, it, it's such a huge impact and and for so long um, you know even people at the at the very kind of greenest edge of the of the building um, sector weren't weren't really thinking about it and so by 2013 I was starting to you know uh, off the side of my desk from my day job 
um, find as much data as I could, starting to, you know, really dive in a little bit and figure out um, what this looked like. And by the end of 2013, I kind of put together um, enough embodied carbon data to, to understand that our buildings were having a, a big impact um, and that, you know, uh, a simple, in this case, you know, I'm showing a model, an early model I did of a thousand square foot building um, that you could have 10 tons of emissions associated with just making the materials for a, a small little house like that. And in fact, you could, if you made the sort of uh, high performance version of that house, you know, it was upwards of 13 tons. And so, you know, this, this was kind of um, both interesting and alarming to me and, and made me feel like I really needed to, to understand uh, even better what was, what was happening here. And so by 2016, uh, I went back to school to, uh, to do a master's degree to look at this, to really, you know, be able to dive in and, and get some guidance on the, on the sort of like climate science and, and academic side of things that as a, a builder, um, you know, I wasn't so familiar with. And what I found was really interesting at that time was that there was a lot of guesswork going on, even in academia. Um, there, there weren't, um, there wasn't a really consistent methodology for how people were looking at this. Um, a lot of the tools that were available had kind of big gaps and flaws in them. And, and in particular, the, the thing that really um, struck me was that there was no um, rational thinking about carbon storage and building materials uh, at all. It was either being ignored or, um, you know, kind of brushed aside, but, but nobody was, was actually uh, thinking about it as a, as a potential solution to um, the huge carbon footprint of buildings. And so, you know, the whole study of, of emissions from um, any products, but in this case, building materials, is based on life cycle assessment, where you know you sort of look at the the emissions that happen um, along every phase of a of a product's life cycle, from extracting the raw materials, transporting them to a factory, from the processes that happen in the factory, then getting them to a site, and then you know putting them into a building, repairing them, fixing them, replacing them, and eventually you know at the end of life you know, dismantling them and doing whatever, uh, landfilling them, incinerating them, however they get disposed. And, you know, there, obviously there's, there's lots of factors uh, over the whole life cycle of the building, but what became really clear when I started to look at this is that, you know, the vast majority of the, the emissions from every building material that I could find was, you know, no less than 65% of, of the total and sometimes as much as 85% of the total. And so before the, the material even like gets put into a building, that's where the lion's share of the emissions have occurred. And then a much smaller bit, five or 6% happens in transporting those to a construction site. Another couple percent happens on the site, putting them into a building. And then sort of later, you know, in the lifespan, um, some, some emissions happen as you sort of fix and replace materials. And then again, you know, anywhere from sort of three to 15% at, at end of life. But, you know, it was very clear that, that it was this, um, this upfront piece um, where, where all, you know, where we could really make a, a big impact. And so because I was kind of um, dissatisfied with the, the existing tools while I, was, while I was trying to do this research, um, I ended up building my own tool so that I could, um, you know, look at things uh, the way I thought was appropriate. I wanted to only use environmental product declarations. I was glad to hear Steve say that Bodo has one for their, uh, for their products. It's a, it's an ISO sort of standardized way of um, reporting on the life cycle of, uh, of products. And because everybody in a particular category is following the same category rules and counting and not counting the same things. You get as close to an even playing field as you can. So um, I wanted to make a tool where the only data I was using was EPDs. And, um, and so I kind of made this spreadsheet and, uh, and, and uh, generated uh, some results for some sample buildings here in Ontario. And the results were 
pretty eye-opening in that if I made the exact same building, so the same level of energy efficiency, the same size, the same number of rooms, like everything is the same. But if, if I chose materials from the high end of all of those uh, EPDs, a single small building, a uh, residential building, could have almost 250 kilograms of emissions per square meter of floor area um, associated with, with the materials that made that building. And then by choosing different materials, I could drop that carbon footprint uh, a huge amount. You know, I could take uh, materials from sort of the mid range of all of those EPDs and get that down to 90 kilograms per square meter. This model here, the minus 11, was a really exciting one because that was picking all the materials that were commonly available and sort of best in category in terms of low low carbon footprint. And you know that was that was exciting to see that you know in this part of the world anyway we could feasibly build a, a kind of zero carbon building on the material side um, without you know having to revert to you know, interesting alternative materials, which if you look at the next model where we're storing 137 kilograms of emissions per square meter, you know, that's those materials, that's, you know, things like straw bale and hempcrete, uh, along with uh, timber and, and other materials. You know, if you put all of those together in a building, uh, you can completely reverse the carbon footprint and, and have a, a pretty large amount of carbon storage in a building. So having done that study and it, it stirring up a lot of interest uh, all around North America, um, I had lots of requests to examine other buildings, do other studies. And so uh, myself and some colleagues kind of took my, my, uh, my first stab at a spreadsheet to, to do that and turned it into a tool called Beam, which you know, really simplified and, and made it a lot easier um, to, to do this kind of analysis. And then we kind of have been uh, doing that uh, pretty much full time for the last couple of years. And the way Beam works, one of the things that I really wanted that I wasn't finding in other tools was I wanted it to be a very comparative tool. I didn't want to choose a whole suite of materials and then get to an answer at the end, which is kind of how the other tools I was looking at used. I wanted to, in this case, you know, here's uh, an example of the cavity insulation section. Um, for for walls that's in beam and I have an area that's that's imported from the, the building dimensions I specify uh, an R value and I can just scan the list there's all the carbon footprints of all the insulation products that I might want to choose to to put in the building and I can see uh, at a glance which ones have a high carbon footprint which ones are lower which ones are carbon storing and so that was sort of one of the really critical things that we wanted to do with beam was make make these kind of like at a glance um, comparisons really easy. So we took that tool and uh, we had uh, some really interesting opportunities to do some studies. The Canadian government hired us to uh, look at um, homes across Canada. We looked at 190 models there. We did uh, over 500 homes for the region of Toronto and we did uh, 35 homes for the city of Nelson, BC. And what was interesting is we started to see that, you know, that my initial models were, were pretty accurate, that, that we were kind of getting um, the same kind of re results, didn't matter how, uh, where the building was built in the country, what the design was really like, uh, or even necessarily how energy efficient it was. Um, so you can kind of see a summary of those studies. Over on the left, you've got all the worst results that kind of range from uh, you know the low 300 kilograms per square meter to uh, up over 560 in Toronto. The thing that 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 really stands out um, as we sort of analyze all of these is that is that the average you know anywhere we look across the country is actually within a pretty narrow range so that gives us a, a pretty good indication that um, you know that that's uh, both a, a sort of an average, obviously, but also, you know, a very achievable threshold for governments looking to, you know, start drawing a line somewhere and asking people to design buildings that come in under it, you know, somewhere between that 150 to 190 um, is highly achievable. And then, you know, there were some really uh, exciting results in, in some of the studies, um, in particular, 
um, the Anarchan and the, the Nelson study where, again, you know, builders just building houses not to be a low carbon house, but just by, you know, fluke, I guess, in some ways, um, we're, we're getting, um, you know, quite, quite low, like 72 kilograms per square meter is, is half of the national average. And yet that's being achieved by a builder who's, you know, building affordable buildings in a code compliant way, you know, in a, in a sort of professional setting and not setting out to, to build a low carbon building. So it's kind of, you know, gives you an indication how much low hanging fruit there is um, out there for, for us to really cut the, the carbon footprint of these homes. And then some really interesting, you know, outstanding results where, um, where buildings are kind of at uh, pretty much carbon neutral or even carbon storing. And so for the Canadian government, what they were, you know, interested in is what, what does that mean for uh, emissions across the country? And so if we kind of take these, uh, this average and, and extend it to all the new homes that are built in the country in a year, um, that means that the materials for building our small low rise homes uh, in Canada every year is somewhere between eight and 10 million tons of emissions a year. So it's a huge um, contributor, you know, building by building, it might not seem like a lot, but um, at the rate that buildings happen, uh, it's pretty big. When we shut down, we shut down a handful of coal-fired power plants in um, in Ontario uh, about ten years ago now, and that made the same difference that that you know that's an equivalent amount of emissions. And so, if we can you know cut these down or get rid of them, um, we're going to be doing uh, the same as, as builders as as the government was able to do by by stopping uh, making power with coal. And so when we kind of looked at, you know, what, what was it that made the, the outstanding results or the, the really low results in these studies, why were these buildings like that? It wasn't the size of them, it wasn't the shape of them, it wasn't the performance of them. Um, and what we realized was to some degree or another, they all incorporated a lot of carbon storage from, uh, from biomass, from plant-based materials. And so that's what I'm going to sort of focus on now, uh, hence the, the title of the talk, you know, carbon drawdown now. It's like, how, how can we not just reduce emissions in buildings, but actually turn buildings into carbon sinks? And so the, the sort of the first material that, that people tend to think of when, when thinking about biomass in buildings uh, is timber. And, you know, it's, it's got a long history in buildings. Um, there are people doing great things with timber. I mean, what, you know, the, the heat treated wood from Oboto is a really great uh, example of that. Um, but currently timber is not something in, in our tool and in a lot of uh, LCA analysis happening here in North America that's being counted uh, as carbon storage because the, the way that um, the life cycle assessment is done of forests is currently sort of missing some pieces that, that are really important to understand, um, you know, whether or not uh, putting parts of a tree in a building actually contributes to uh, a better climate or a worse climate. And so right now, the a timber LCA kind of looks at the emissions that happen from kind of like the time the chainsaw hits the tree to the time it makes it to your building. Um, but what, what that analysis misses is that um, a, a, about half of the tree typically doesn't make it into a building and ends up uh, returning to the atmosphere, um, often as fuel for the kilns to dry the wood, um, but also as um, slash and branches and, and bark and things like that, that that aren't put into the building. There's also not accounting currently for root mass um, that's left in the ground to, uh, to turn back into carbon dioxide or carbon that comes out of the soils from the soils being uh, disturbed. So there's, there's a lot of, of stuff to figure out uh, around whether wood is, is, a, is actually a carbon sink. The, the thing that, you know, I think the, the simple way of looking at it is if we're, if we're making our forests, which are the planet's main carbon repositories, um, if we're making the forest smaller while we're making more timber buildings, that's not going to fix the climate. Um, now, I was interested to see, um, Steve sent me something earlier today that, that, um, that indicated that, that FSC forests in New Zealand 
um, specifically do get bigger as the wood comes out of them and that would that would certainly go uh, a long way to um, you know justifying considering um, carbon storage from timber but I can certainly also say that the forestry industry in North America is nowhere near being able to make that claim so it's great to see that that's happening in New Zealand and I, I'm going to definitely uh, explore that more but um, you know for now in, in our analysis we still use a lot of wood. I, I don't discourage people from using wood. It has, compared to almost every other material out there, an incredibly low carbon footprint. Um, it's just maybe not uh, carbon storing at this point. I've just, sorry, Chris, I've just quickly mm -hmm. shared the report, which, are, which we were chatting sure. about a little bit earlier. So if anyone wants the official report on that, it's in the handouts. Go on. Great. Yeah, that's good. I, I will make use of that too. <laughs> Um, so for the, the biomass in, in our studies that, that, that brought those buildings, you know, down to, you know, carbon neutral or even carbon storing, um, the, the biomass that we are considering there is kind of all other biomass, um, that's not timber based. So, uh, we, we, we create lots of biomass, uh, every year on the planet, uh, a lot, uh, of it, um, due to farming. So, uh, ag residues is a huge pool of, um, of, uh, of biomass, um, but also, you know, purpose grown things like uh, cork bark and bamboo and hemp and things like that. And currently, you know, the, with the, the way the sort of natural carbon cycle works on the planet is these plants draw down billions of tons of CO2, they make their bodies out of the carbon. Uh, and then at the end of the plant's life, the plant is eaten, burnt, you know, rotted, but you know, the vast majority of that carbon goes back to the atmosphere pretty quickly. And often even when we turn some of that biomass into products like, you know, paper, clothing, uh, things like that, um, those have a pretty short lifespan and, and end up uh, back in the atmosphere pretty quickly too. So, you know, the, the, the way that we can, we can both make the, the numbers, the carbon numbers for our buildings look good, but also make a huge impact on, on the climate is to interrupt that cycle, is to, you know, let plants do their work, let them draw the billions of tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere, but then bank that in, in buildings and have it stay uh, in the built environment for, you know, at least 50 or 60 years, but hopefully uh, even longer than that. And if we can interrupt uh, that flow enough and put enough carbon in buildings, uh, it actually you know, makes a, a sizable impact uh, on the climate. So buildings that, that do that, uh, I'm gonna show you a, a couple case studies. So when we were developing BEAM, we got asked by the local university here, Trent University, um, to help them with the design of a, what they wanted to do was meet the uh, International Living Future Institute's zero carbon certification program uh, and that's a program that looks at the operating emissions of a building so you know they were setting out to make a zero carbon building on the operation side and we said well that's great um, why don't we try to do that on the material side too and uh, and then you'll have a, a real uh, net zero carbon building and so they were game for that and so, you know, the basic strategy for, for trying to bring the carbon footprint of your materials down a lot, there's kind of two pieces to it. One is you, you find the, the lowest carbon footprint version of all the materials that you can't have be carbon storing. So, you know, currently we don't have carbon storing concrete. We don't have carbon storing underground insulation. We, you know, there's a lot of things that, um, that we can't just make uh, into a car make from carbon storing materials right now. So we do that by finding the lowest carbon option for all of those. So um, making concrete by getting rid of a lot of the virgin Portland cement in it and using uh, SCMs to, um, to, to offset uh, a lot of that Portland cement. So we were able to reduce the carbon footprint of the concrete in the building by about 40%. We used a recycled foam glass gravel as subslab insulation instead of a, a foam product. We used a, a wood chip based um, insulated concrete form for the foundation walls. So, you know, those kinds of things uh, brought the carbon footprint of, of the, the, the sort of high emitting parts of the building down. And then 
we started to put the uh, the carbon storing materials uh, into place. So in this case, that included um, a uh, precast hempcrete block uh, for a wall system, cellulose insulation in the roof, wood fiberboard insulation on some of the, uh, the upper sections of the building, and um, and a, a hemp bat or hemp wool insulation um, inboard of the uh, the hempcrete blocks. And then also a, uh, a locally milled charred wood siding for about half the, the area of the exterior. And so you can sort of see there's the there's the building. It doesn't you know look particularly um, different than a, than you know than other buildings. But we knew from uh, from the design team at Trent what they were going to build it out of before we got involved. And so you know by running that base case building through Beam, we saw that. The building was going to have um, uh, about 211 tons of emissions associated with its um, with its materials, and that would equal uh, just under 500 kilograms per square meter. So, if you recall the results I showed you earlier, like that's pretty high. Um, but again, like that that's just a normal building, so it wasn't excessively high. It's just that's that's a, a pretty average range for a uh, especially a, a commercial or institutional building. And so with all our material substitutions, um, we were able to reduce that carbon footprint by 88%. Uh, we got it from 211 tons down to 25 tons. And then we did look at, well, what happens if we did count the carbon storage in the timber? And you know, we, we had, we felt a pretty good case with Trent for, for doing that. Um, we did make sure that all the wood that went into the building was from certified forests. Um, an awful lot of it was uh, locally milled, and so um, if we if we you know then counted the carbon storage in the timber, then the building actually tipped um, from just being a, an incredibly low carbon building to a carbon storing building, and uh, with a net storage of just under seven tons. So you know when we start doing buildings like this, now this building is set up to be net zero carbon on its operational side, which you know is happening more and more. But now it's you know zero carbon uh, on its material side, and that's pretty much you know when people say, well, we've got to have zero emissions by 2040 or 2050 or whatever uh, the target happens to be, then then this is what we need to be able to do, right? We need to be able to have buildings that are that are addressing that on both uh, both sides of the uh, the equation, the the operations and the material side. We also, uh, I'll show you one more little case study. This is a, um, a demonstration home that we built with the school. Um, and we, we definitely set out to have a zero carbon footprint on the material side, but also to, again, be a, a, a zero net energy building and to also have a, a zero toxin building and a zero waste building. So um, fairly ambitious goals for a, for a house project. Um, but the thing that, that we really kind of wanted to, to do with this house was think about if we're going to make these buildings store carbon, how do we make sure that that carbon has the longest possible time out of the atmosphere and in the building? And, you know, we realized that one of the things that, one of the reasons that buildings come down, in fact, here in, in Canada, the leading reason that buildings come down is not that they're not still structurally sound or not useful or you know couldn't be occupied but somebody wants to change what's on the land they want uh, they want something bigger development changes uh, land use changes and buildings get torn down because it's just not the building that somebody wants there anymore and so with zero house what we wanted to do was fully um, make a building that you could put up and take down um, numerous times if you wanted to and not just structurally, but with the, the cladding, with the finishes, you know, the whole building, uh, we wanted to make something that you could take apart and put together again. And so we actually did that. We uh, built the building here in our home city of Peterborough. Um, you can see the, the prefab panels that we used are really just, you know, wood frame boxes filled with a variety of different uh, types of insulation materials including cellulose, including straw, including wood fiberboard, uh, including cork, including wool. There was a, a whole bunch of approaches that we, uh, that we took to uh, making the various panels. 
when the panels were all built, um, all our um, you know air tightness barriers and, and weather barriers uh, were wrapped on them. The uh, the strapping for uh, for finishes was already on them. So that meant that that we could put the building together um, in less than a day. We could go from uh, the trucks arriving to uh, to a fully closed in building, and then we attach all the finishes back to it. And that meant that you know we actually built and and, and dismantled that building three times. So um, it now lives on a permanent foundation, and somebody lives in it. But you know, in the future, if that's not where that building wants to be. Uh, it can be dismantled and, and moved. And again, it's an example of, you know, being sort of net carbon storing. So this one ended up having about 25 tons of net storage and a conventionally built house of the same size would have had about 45 tons of emissions. And one of the things I, I like to point out with this project is, you know, you can clearly see there's a lot of metal siding on that building. Um, there's a bunch of glazing in that building. Like, I'm not advocating that every material in a building needs to be carbon storing. It needs to be, you know, made out of biogenic material. Um, you can achieve, you know, net carbon storage by properly balancing the, the materials that do store carbon and the ones that have emissions associated with them, and uh, and kind of, you know, working until you you hit that balance. If you want to hit zero, you can hit zero. If you want to hit you know, 50 kilograms per square meter, you can hit that. If you want to store, you know, 50 tons, you can do that. So um, it's really, it's really a matter of, um, you know, thinking about your project and, and, uh, and setting a goal and then choosing your material palette to, to help you get there. Now in, in, in Canada, uh, my practice is building pretty small buildings, um, but, uh, in particular, in Europe, this kind of biomass building has has you know moved a lot faster, and, and the buildings have gotten a lot bigger. So I just wanted to give you a sense that these aren't all just you know uh, odd little buildings uh, here and there throughout North uh, North America. Um, you know, this is a very large uh, school in France, made with prefabricated straw bale panels. This is um, the retrofit of a really large community center in the Netherlands. Um, where they kind of did a wrap, uh, an insulating wrap around the building, and the insulation is a uh, is a chopped uh, wheat straw that's blown into the uh, to the cavities they built uh, around the outside of the building. This is a large uh, Marks and Spencers mall in the UK, and it's a timber frame building with uh, prefabricated hempcrete panels. Another prefab straw bale panel uh, building. Uh, this time on a university in uh, in the UK. This is a seven-story uh, apartment building in um, in France, and uh, again, it's a it's sort of a timber frame with uh, with straw bale panels. This is a uh, prefab hempcrete panel uh, apartment building in downtown Paris. So you can see, you know, that these these types of of, uh, of carbon storing materials. You know they may not be common, um, but they're pretty well tested out and pretty well proven out, and people are starting to to do some uh, quite large and uh, and and interesting different types of buildings from multifamily to um, to commercial to uh, to institutional. And uh, this is the last one, but I, I I think this one's really interesting. This is um, the Enterprise Center in the UK, and it's in a part of England that was well known for its, its sort of like, you know, old thatched roofs. And um, they actually had some of those uh, experienced thatchers come up with a way to prefabricate thatch panels to, uh, to act as the cladding on the outside of the building. So, um, you know, a, a really uh, large building uh, covered in thatch. And they also used a, a lot of different uh, sort of bio-based materials uh, in the building as well. So, just some, you know, some uh, some examples of, of things that are going on that, that sort of, you know, show that that the, the, our ability to be able to store lots of carbon in buildings is certainly there if we have the uh, the ambition to uh, to try to uh, achieve it. And this is the, uh, the the last slide, and then we can uh, we can get into some questions. But you know, for the the results of the work we've been doing here in North America, if we take um, the kind of average results and, and look at all the houses that are built in the US every year, um, 
there's somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 54 million tons of emissions occurring just from low-rise residential building, which is just a fraction of all the building that gets done. Um, and so, you know, it's a huge uh, impact. That's the equivalent of about 15 coal-fired power plants. And if we were able to uh, take all those buildings and we sort of, we know we can uh, get them to be uh, even just, uh, you know, reasonably carbon storing, we not only avert that whole 54 million tons of emissions, but we're capable of, of banking another, you know, 35, 36 million tons on an annual basis as well. And so, you know, with the, the dire news coming out of the IPCC uh, today uh, about how quickly we need to move, how quickly we need to both reduce emissions and pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, you know, here's, here's how you do that uh, in the buildings world. You, you, you stop making buildings that have a huge carbon footprint in their materials and you start making them so that they're net stores of carbon and you're doing both of those things that uh, that the climate really needs us to do right now. So yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the end of the the slide part. And yeah, I'd be very happy to uh, to take any questions and and have any kind of discussion that people want. Chris, uh, on behalf of Abado and the attendees, I just wanted to thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, before we go into questions. Uh, personally, I found it quite, it, it, a slightly different angle as to how to view things. We've, uh, we've all seen um, similar themed uh, webinars, um, but the way you're able to uh, pictorially show uh, the significant impact of, um, of, of good design uh, in, in, uh, in storing carbon in buildings and, and considering buildings uh, as an opportunity for significant um, uh, biomass buildings for significant carbon storage has been quite quite refreshing. Uh, the importance of material selection, um, I, I've, the, the retrofit of some of those buildings was was quite interesting as as, as well. So, uh, look, I think uh, a lot of us got um, some very good points out of it, and I, I hope that uh, people um, considering the uh, the selection of materials and the reuse aspect and the value of the reuse of buildings and the longevity of the carbon inside those buildings as important factors going forward as they design. So thank you, and we look forward to some questions. Awesome. Okay, um, we'll just go to the questions. Most of them seem to do with fire, which is very interesting. But one question was, um, and I'm guessing it's someone from probably the South Island of New Zealand saying, um, Hi, Chris, does Ontario have structural seismic regulations? And if so, how did the products you used perform? Yeah, I mean, the, the particular area that I live in has pretty light seismic requirements, but, um, you know, the, 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 these kinds of buildings also get built in British Columbia, in California, in Oregon, even places with really high seismic uh, uh, requirements and it's it's interesting you know i mean i kind of talked about a lot of different materials so there's not it's not like there's a single um approach you know a lot of those buildings do still use like some form of timber frame whether it's a heavy timber frame or sort of like a, 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 you know, a light wood frame in which case they're just you know the frame is doing that work seismically whatever you know mm. uh requirements have been developed for whatever area to to make a wood frame do that and then you're just sort of putting different insulations into that so that's you know one strategy is to is to stick with existing um, structural systems um, but you know in, in particular um, straw bale construction is really interesting seismically because um, structurally speaking you know you kind of have this stack of straw bales and you put a plaster coating on both sides of them and and it's that plaster that's that's acting as the structure, um, you know, to to handle all the normal loads of the building. But when when they've done seismic testing, and there's been quite a number of seismic tests done now, they put you know the straw bale walls on the shake plates. What's really interesting is that the straw bales have enough structure that even if all the plaster shakes off them, they still keep a roof up overhead. And because because 
once the plaster is gone, the bales have like an incredible ability to absorb a lot of energy. There's nothing to break like the, you know, as long as the, the strings stay tied, which they appear to do in all the seismic tests, it wobbles around a whole lot. But if you designed it so that your roof plate is anchored to your foundation, people use a lot of different types of straps and things like that to make that happen, um, that it's actually a, like an incredibly stable uh, way to build uh, at least, you know, under three story buildings um with seismic uh, seismic conditions that's really interesting i mean i know in places like japan you know they've got some buildings which are 500 years old plus and i mean in certain parts of japan they do have a lot of earthquakes and so forth and those buildings are still standing i mean we know that um when something natural like that that occurs um, timber can take a lot more stress, you know, it can take that negative energy and actually, you know, contain it compared to something like steel. Um, we've had a few people just asking with regards to the, uh, the fire regulations. Um, probably the best one will say is how do you address, you know, the fire rating requirements uh, on straw insulated walls, uh, hemp panels, um, for roofs and for walls as well. How do you address yeah. that? Yeah, so again, I mean, you know, it's there. there's a bunch of different materials I talked about. So um, hempcrete's an interesting one because the, the, the crete part of the hempcrete name comes from the fact that it's, it's the chopped up core of the hemp plant, uh, which is sort of like a light, airy um, kind of uh, plant material, but it actually gets coated in lime and that's what that's what makes it stick together and that's why they call it hempcrete. Um, so hempcrete has an incredible fire rating because every little piece of hemp is essentially coated in stone. Um, so it, it doesn't burn, it, 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 it's really exceptional in, in fire tests. And in fact, you know, some, some of the buildings that use it, use it specifically because of how good it is in a fire. Um, the, interestingly, straw walls are, are kind of the same. Um, here in Canada, a straw wall meets a, uh, a two-hour fire rating for, um, for commercial use and far surpasses the 45-minute the test for uh, residential. And same with all of those other, you know, the larger buildings I showed you, you know, they, the, I'm sure the authorities in France don't allow a school to be built out of something without it, you know, being tested and meeting those requirements. I don't know what, what test standards they use, but um, you know, every, every material has its vulnerabilities. Um, these kinds of ag fiber materials, they, they're, they're fire, they're quite fire safe when they're, you know, in a, in a very densely packed, uh, environment in the same way that cellulose insulation is because you sort of lack the, the oxygen to support combustion. So you can get some charring, but you don't get, um, full burn. So in the same way, you know, a straw bale works the way, you know, if you if you had a telephone book or an encyclopedia and you drop it on a fire, it doesn't burst into flames. If you ripped every page out and fed it into the fire, it would burn really well. And the same kind of goes with with um, with straw or any other kind of egg fiber when they're you know densely compressed. Um, there's not enough oxygen to support that burn. But if you just scattered them you know uh, out on the ground and lit them on fire, they they certainly would burn. Um, but I think you know. We, they're no, they're no more or less vulnerable to fire than almost any other material, right? When we look at the sort of the use of um, plastic foam products in buildings, like that's essentially an insulation made out of a fire accelerant. And yet, you know, we figure out ways to make sure that that, for, you know, by and large, that operates well. And I, I see in the chat that there, you know, there was a a note about a, a fire in a a straw insulated roof. I don't know the particulars of that, but I would say there have probably been fires in every kind of insulated roof in New Zealand at some point or another. And I'm sure, you know, the conditions for some reason weren't, uh, weren't appropriate there. Um, but I don't think it means that, you know, um, straw should never be used. But if, if somebody had just say, scattered a bunch of straw in an attic, hoping that that would keep them warm, it would have kept them warm, but those, you know, that would make that straw uh, vulnerable to, uh, to combustion. So, you know, without knowing the specific, it's, it's hard to say, but, you know, here in, in Canada, we have over 1500 straw bale buildings now dating back 30 years. There's never been a fire. So 
um, you know, I think it's it's not it's not like it couldn't happen, but but it's certainly not prone to it. And um, as with you know any material in any regulated environment, you know we're not allowed to to put up a building without being able to show that uh, that we've met all the, the fire requirements for our jurisdiction. That is really awesome. Um, guys, would it be really handy is if anyone has worked with any with with hempcrete? Um, is seems to be of particular interest. If anyone's worked with a company or used a hempcrete or a particular brand, go for it and put it in the chat just so you can share that information. Um, someone asked about vermin. Any uh, issues with vermin? Again, you know, not not inherently so. When when the materials are are sort of like well built and densely packed, it's not a particularly um, conducive environment. Um, you know, we have built lots of houses, especially in rural areas, that do end up uh, having you know mice in them or something. But the mice will be um, in the nice, light, fluffy insulation that we put in the floor joists or you know somewhere else in the building. Um, and again, it's not to say they they can't end up in say a straw wall or a hempcrete wall, but um, it's not it's not a very hospitable environment for them. Um, they have to do like a lot of excavation of a lot of dense material uh, in order to get in there. And you know, everybody's experience in my client list has been there's better places for them to go in the house, easier places for them to go. But um, you know, uh, you you aren't ever going to convince vermin to never try to move in with us. We make really nice habitats <laughs> for them to join us, but um, it hasn't. You know, it hasn't. Again, with like you know, hundreds and hundreds of buildings. Uh, up for a few decades now, it, it hasn't shown itself to be um, any any more prone to that, and, and in a lot of cases less. That's awesome. Um, someone just also asked the question of, um, you know, making sure you know what what brands are here in Australia, that kind of thing. I'll answer that. We are what we're actually going to be doing. Our what we're hoping to do with our next webinar session. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely be running a couple of sessions on this is having someone that's local here in Australia that is involved in this industry and has a particular um, study or, or, or interest in uh, low carbon or, or uh, with, with a high, high embodied carbon. So different types of building materials, because obviously, you know, we're this is interesting and this is expanding everyone's minds and what's happening on the other side of the world. But we're as passionate as you about getting, um, you know, people using this and actually actioning it now. So really, really keen. Yeah. And I know there are like, there's a, an association called Ausbale, the Australian Straw Bale Building Association. Um, they've been as, you know, active and busy there as, as we have been here in Canada for, you know, for many years now. And uh, I have seen um, at least a, a good handful of, of hempcrete builders based in Australia too. So, you know, there certainly is some expertise there. I, I'm, you know, not the best person to direct you right to them, but, um, but you know, there, there is quite a bit of work uh, going on there uh, with materials like this. Yeah, and also, you know, more so in Australia and New Zealand, but also, and, and I didn't really touch on it because it's not happening so much here in North America, but uh, or in my part of North America, but earthen buildings, you know, that earth-based materials are another great way to, um, they're not carbon storing, but they can be incredibly low carbon. So if you can be, you know, replacing uh, your concrete blocks with compressed earth blocks and your, you know, uh, concrete floors with with adobe floors and things like that. Um, that's another one of those you know great strategies. You take something that might have emitted you know uh, you know 10, 20, 30 tons of emissions in your building and bring it close to zero, and then suddenly you don't need a whole lot of carbon storing material to uh, to get yourself into carbon storing territory. I think you're on on mute, Steve. Sorry, someone just popped Sorry. a link just asking in the chat box there whether this is your beam tool in the living future. Um, while Chris is just doing that, does anyone need any help with the CPD questions or have we got all that covered? 
Steve, before we go into that, there's an um, interesting question here from uh, from Barrett about uh, making the transition for a small boutique architectural studio doing bespoke homes to make the first step into the right direction and, and, and bringing clients along. So whether um, Chris has any advice or suggestions around um, helping architects uh, make the transition and bringing, bringing their clients along with them on some of these principles? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we've learned, um, and especially from working with some more mainstream contractors and the, the beam tool is that there's a whole bunch of low hanging fruit that doesn't have to, it doesn't even necessarily change anything about the building, right? If you, if you can go to your concrete supplier and specify a really high SCM concrete mix, it, there's nothing different about the concrete. It, it takes, you know, slightly longer to set up, but it's, you know, not, not in a problematic way. It costs the same. It's got, it actually gets stronger. And like, so there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of things like that where, um, you know, some of the, some of the low hanging fruit is just, just that. Um, and then, yeah, you know, we, we work with developers here to sort of lay out, you know, you're not going to go from a conventional build, to some like crazy straw bale thing, you know, tomorrow. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we talk about is, yeah, find that low hanging fruit, try the, the carbon storing materials that, that already have a long track record. You know, one of the unsung heroes in, in a lot of the buildings in our study is good old cellulose insulation, you know, <laughs> ground up newspaper. It's got an 80 year track record. Um, it's, you know, it's used really, widely but not really widely here but i can get it at, at every building supply store and you know just a move to cellulose insulation makes a big difference um, our buildings uh here now we have to put a sort of uh, continuous insulation all the way around the outside of the building and so moving away from foam into something you know like wood fiber board which again is like a, a product that's been around for a long time like the exact same sort of frame house building made with low carbon concrete, cellulose insulation, and wood fiber board exterior insulation, like that, that knocks your carbon footprint in half and nothing else changed. And your client doesn't even know that those things are different. They don't see them. So, you know, I think there are a lot of steps like that. Um, you know, I think like a cladding, like, you know, like the, like, you know, we saw at the beginning, what a Bodo does, that's going to be, you know, a really low carbon option for, uh, for the exterior of the building. And I think, you know, you, you don't, you don't even necessarily have to sell it to a client as low carbon. Some are interested in that and you could sell it that way, but sometimes, you know, like when people saw our little zero house project, like they just thought that was a really great house and they really liked what it looked like and didn't really matter, you know, what it was made out of. Um, so I think, you know, where the, where the client wants to be hitting those low carbon numbers, you can really work with them on that. But I think, you know, you could make uh, like a really great house that nobody knew was low carbon that, that, you know, you might not be quite getting to zero, but you're getting down to some pretty low numbers without, without, you know, kind of like the sleeper low carbon house uh, where nobody even knows that, that, uh, that that's what you're attempting to do. And I guess there's a cost uh, element there too. So I'll just address that by saying, when we did our study for the Canadian government, they wanted us to look at cost. And what we found was zero direct relationship between cost and carbon footprint. So, you know, sometimes the material with the highest carbon footprint also had the highest cost. Um, brick is a great example of that here in Canada. Almost every, you know, single family home is clad in, in cement or clay brick incredibly expensive material and with an incredibly high carbon footprint you could change to any other cladding uh, and half your costs and so you know but then we also found you know sometimes the 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 lowest carbon option was also the lowest price cellulose insulation is a great example of that like in our market it's the cheapest insulation and has the lowest carbon footprint and then it could be anything in between those like sometimes the carbon storing one was the most expensive like it wasn't a predictor like the, the carbon footprint of the material and its relative cost wasn't there's no direct correlation. And so, again, like when we're working with developers, you know, we're trying to find that path where the you know, there's a good 
return on their their money for for making a low carbon home and sometimes it's you know the low carbon option is the way to go just for cost you don't even have to be thinking about carbon and then sometimes you know you might be weighing up and trading off other uh, other elements i think a lot i think about the carbon thing a lot the same way that that a designer approaches you know coming up with an energy model for a building it's like you don't you don't just you know make the most energy efficient building possible every single time like there's always factors that you weigh up and you look at the cost of say the triple pane windows versus the double pane windows and is the return on that worth the you know the extra performance and you know we just mix the carbon footprint in with all of those considerations and uh, it just sort of becomes you know in our practice a leading thing but it's not you know we don't always just choose the lowest carbon material we're also concerned about cost and durability and you know all those other things so it's just something that we we weigh in but what we find is when you share the data with people then at least you know and it, it, it can become a sort of informed decision um, versus just you know all the other good reasons you might choose a material without considering its carbon footprint that's awesome um, we'll just finish on the last one here um, before moving into the CPD questions. Damien just uh, mentioned about the tools and resources necessary to execute material carbon emission assessment. Um, we're actually we're going to be focusing on that on the next couple of months. So within the within the months coming, uh, hopefully fingers crossed next month, um, we'll be working with someone and we'll be doing a webinar just like this. So someone who's local here in Australia who um, can help those local in Australia and in New Zealand as well, so that you know they have the tools to be able to choose the the low embodied carbon building materials. So watch the space; we will keep you updated. Um, yeah, and our, our tool Beam is it's uh, it gets released at the end of this month, and it's free. It won't you know it is North American focused, but um, I think you'll find you know there's there's some common themes you know it it takes a lot of energy to say melt rocks and it doesn't matter where you melt those rocks and you know that like a lot of the processes are the same so a lot of the, the carbon footprints will be the same and then beam also has a way that you can input your own custom epds so if you have local ones um you can put those in but you know i would imagine that there are probably better you know tools more focused on your market there Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So um, one of the questions on the question sheet was explain the relationship between operational emissions and material carbon emissions uh, and the importance of designing and building for the reduction of both. Are you able to just summarize that as an answer, Chris? Yeah, I think um, there's a there's a few facets to that. But, you know, one is that the the material emissions the bulk of them happen before anybody moves into the building and they're often um they represent you know more than um 10 20 in our canadian government study sometimes even over 100 years of operational emissions and so as you know the building industry has this great focus now on reducing those those operating emissions and that's great you just have to be able to now balance that with the material emissions as you as you reduce the carbon footprint of the operations, the percentage that is now your materials, you know, if you don't reduce that too, it becomes it becomes really big. Oh, you're muted again. Sorry, you were on. You're on mute, Steve. Sorry, I'm on mute. Oh my goodness. Um, explain the concept of life cycle assessment and its role in understanding a building's environmental and climate impacts, impacts over time and how the LCA informs the generation of EPDs. Yeah, so a life cycle assessment, you know, it, it, it looks at the impacts, not just the climate impacts, there's sort of seven categories of impact that, that an LCA usually uh, looks at. Um, so this here we were focused on on the global warming potential, but it also looks at acidification, eutrophication, smog generation. There, there's some other factors, um, but essentially LCA sets up rules for you know 
how you count emissions and what the, what parts of the process you count uh, and in what way. And then um, once you've completed a life cycle assessment for a product, um, an EPD is is sort of the um, the standardized way of reporting that information um, in a in a kind of standardized format so that that people can sort of use that data uh, like an LCA study is huge and then you sort of narrow it down to an EPD which kind of boils it down to its its essence. Um, and then uh, explain the principles of carbon storage and building materials and how this can impact overall material carbon emissions. So. Um, so could you say like plant-based materials capture atmospheric carbon as the plants grow? Yep. And this locks away the carbon? Yep. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, the last question was uh, identify the tools and resources necessary to execute a material carbon emissions assessment for a project. This is actually something I'm leaving open and it's something which I'm wanting everyone to go away and go, okay. And I think we've mentioned a couple of companies here, but to actually go away and explore three companies or three building materials, which you can start using, which are um, very low carbon or actually store carbon. One of them obviously would be the Aboda Vulcan would be number one. So what are other building materials which you can start using from today or tomorrow um, or tools that you know that are out there? We're kind of riding out of time um, and I'm very much aware that it is 25 to 11 night for you on a Monday night, Chris. So I really don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, but thank you again for the second session and you've really inspired us. Um, and yeah, thank you on behalf of everyone from Australia. And yes, so he's just, Chris has just shared that the, the beam tool will be available from builders for climate action .org. So you guys yeah, can in the last, in the last week of April. So in a few weeks it'll it'll be live there fantastic fantastic well what i can do is um i've got the email addresses of everybody that attended so i can just share that link for with them i can just put a note in my diary and i can send them an all an email with the link to that to that right. tool that that'd be awesome okay that's cool. great well thank thanks everybody that was thanks for the great questions and uh and, and thanks for, to the aboto team for the opportunity to talk to everyone no thank you awesome sleep well cheers thanks <laughs> good night